Hand-to-hand -hand transaction is an automatic 25 to life in Dubai. I was put on death row. My case partners who were with me were not put on death row. They wanted to make an example out of me. If you don't give us this willingly, we'll make you piss yourself and we will gather your piss off the floor. If not, you see these 20 guys here with me, they'll run a train on you and I'll still make sure I get my urine test off you. The thought of getting caught is never on your mind. What's going on guys? Welcome back to the Blue Tick Show, season two, all about crime. Opposite me today, we got Z, the man, the first man from the UK to go on death row in Dubai for, well Z, you can tell us what you went on death row for. For 0 0.03 of cocaine. 0 0.03 of cocaine. Now let me make that clear, that's not 0 0.3, like under half a gram, that's 0 0.03. Which is so that's literally like an empty bag, pretty an much. An empty bag with residue. And they put you on death row. Yeah. Uh, we were, I was put on death row. Yeah. My case partners who were with me were not put on death row. Me being the only foreigner in the case kind of gave me, um, put a lot of scrutiny around my situation, being the only foreigner. Uh, I believe they wanted to make an example out of me. All right, Z, before we give the audience too much, yeah, you lot are probably trying to jump into this right now and know what's going on. Let's throw it all the way back. Let's, do it. Let's start from little baby Z. He was born in the UK. Yeah, Reading. Reading. How did you end up in Dubai? And obviously, I want to hear your whole story. I want to hear how you ended up in Dubai, how you got on death row, and how come you're sitting here in front of me today and you're not dead in Dubai somewhere? By the blessings of Allah, first of all. Well, explain to us... Why you went to Dubai, the years... Just tell me your story. Let's do it. Well, it started in 1997, 1998. That was the first time I ever went to Dubai. Uh, my father relocated his business there. Okay. So the whole family moved out, you know, as you do. Uh, Dubai was in its prime boom back then, you know, early, late 90s, early 2000s. So it was a good opportunity. Moved yeah. out there as a young boy. Um and started adapting to the life in Dubai, you know? Which is different. Which is, ex uh, you know, extremely different. And luckily, because I left the UK quite young, I was not very involved or sucked into the UK traditions yeah. and society. So I was a bit of a 50-50. So when I went to Dubai at a young age, it was a very diverse shock because, as you know, Dubai, you've got 180 nationalities all in a small space, working, living together very diverse city very diverse country and are you just on topic of dubai are you a muslim Alhamdulillah. because it is a very 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 it is a muslim country so they have the rules they follow it very strictly very strictly yeah. so to an extent where i think we, in people uh, underestimate it so in dubai you went out there just for to relocate with the family yeah started off as relocating. what age was you what's going on guys if you're watching this on youtube make sure you scroll down we're now live on spotify so you can watch us while you're driving listen to us listen to us while you're in the gym pretty much just listen to us anywhere and make sure you give us a five star review on spotify thank you uh young boy so like six seven okay yeah really yeah. young uh started my i remember went to it was the only british school there oh wow so obviously when we went when we relocated there my dad wanted me to get a british education yeah, of so we found the only british uh, english speaking school which was in jumeirah back then uh started off there you know reception your year one year two uh just you know your average little boy growing up in a new place and being so diverse i came across multiple nationalities lots of people different ideologies so as a young male you tend to take in a lot you yeah know, you're course. a sponge at that age yeah um so you take bits and bobs from here bits and bobs from there so you had your whole childhood in dubai Pretty your much. whole school life was in dubai Sch and schooling everything from what i remember from school i was a little shit i was causing trouble getting into little fights swearing at people what was it like in school over there did that just huh. see is everyone behaved, literally sat there, yes, yes sir, yes miss? Yes and no. Um, in the British private school that I went to first for a few first years, yeah. it was like that. Sit Proper down, strict, uniform, you couldn't do nothing. Parted hair to the side, every, you know, <laughs> pinstripe uniform. And then I had a, a bit of a rebellious phase where then I told my dad, I want to go to a, you know, a local school, you know. And obviously, because my mother's Egyptian, 
uh, my mum always made sure that you know she would teach us Arabic. Me and my younger sister always teaching us Arabic at home. Yep. Maintaining it, you know. I'd always run away. She'd have to drag me. Come here, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's Arabic class time. And I actually thank her and appreciate that now. That being said, why? Because when I did go and leave the British English speaking school, I went into the, I went into the um, local Emirati school. Yeah. I was dealing with a lot of local national people, which yeah. I hadn't been before at a young age. You know, and I what was it like dealing with the Emiratis? Are they lo lovely people? Very hospitable. Strict. Kind. Strict. They have their morals, they have their values. I mean, even myself as a Muslim, I can understand that, you know, if you go to someone's country or someone's house, you, you, you respect their you rules. respect their rules, their cultures, you know, you, you don't step over their toes. Um, when I joined that school, it showed me another side of rebellious, like okay. rebellion, like, because coming from a very strict, uh, it, it had the, um, that English school that I first went to was, boarding style okay yeah, yeah 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 and then suddenly to be thrown into a it wasn't public but semi-public kind of atmosphere yeah. it threw my mind into two different zones were there like naughty kids was it like uk school yeah exactly really? that okay and that's when i started learning my lingo my arabic started getting much yeah. better so i thought you know what it looks like i'm gonna be in this country for a while let me let me get involved kind exactly. of exactly let me get involved and so I've always, whenever, when I first went to Dubai, which was about four years ago, I remember I, even my dad was like, don't you dare fuck about out there. Do not get into a fight. Don't fuck about. Yeah. And Dubai seen as such a strict country and it's so, don't look at a girl, don't hold a girl's hand. No don't, public display of affection. Like nothing. Absolutely. When I went, I'll be honest. I didn't see it being that bad at all. What's going on? I hope you're all enjoying the episode so far. Make sure you all scroll down, hit subscribe. We're trying to hit 10,000 subscribers. At 10,000 subscribers, there's going to be an amazing episode that's already planned in the pipeline. So hit subscribe. All out the window. It was, we enjoyed ourselves, me and the boys. We had fun. We went out, went out, partied. And as long as you had respect, normal and your respect limits. and your limits, and you weren't, a drunk idiot the on the piss, street basically you was fine yeah you was fine yeah and it was when we got back because everyone, oh, everyone knows me i'm a little shit like i get into trouble wherever i go and they were surprised you came back in one piece <laughs> <laughs> and they were like bloody hell like what was it like i was like it's fine like if if no one told me i wouldn't i wouldn't, I wouldn't have even thought yeah the only thing i only time i saw something happen was my mate was sat in the pool and he had a girl sitting on his lap and the security, like the pool security guard, come over and get off him. Really? Yeah. And I was like, "What well, in the on hmm. on his lap in the pool? Yeah, like on the pool. He just sat on like one of the steps, yeah. and she was sat on his lap. No kissing, nothing really? like that. I'm just, quite surprised. Just chilling, just literally chilling. Walked over, goes, "Get off him." And then I think maybe because there was Dubai resident residents, like Emiratis, the there in the area, they then like had to That's you had to show a little bit more respect. Yeah. But apart from that. I think Dubai is a lovely place, uh, amazing, beautiful. The world, it's a country full of treasure. A country full of future. But I would never bring up a family there. And I was just about to say that. I could never see... Raising your kids and nah. their wife. And I agree 100% with that. I always say, I'd raise my boys, uh, sorry, I'd raise my girls in Dubai, but I'd never raise my boys in Dubai. But then, then... If you raise your girls in Dubai and bring them to the UK, uh -huh. it is like a s massive slap in the face to like a d it, pff, Dubai for a girl and the UK for a girl. It's, <laughs> it's completely yeah. different. Yeah, it is completely different. Whereas I'd much prefer to raise my boys over there, make them learn the respect and the mm -hmm. don't fuck about, mm -hmm. and then bring them to the UK and say, okay. That's kind of what happened with me in, in a rough way. But on the opposite on way. On the opposite. Right the way I didn't anticipate it, but the way I see it is don't raise the boys there. Why? Because me, why not? Because I went at such a young age. You want to be a rebel. Yeah. Dubai spoils you whether you like it or not. Yep. And luckily, thankfully, because I'm in a you know, well-off family, uh, I could go out. I was DJing. Um, yeah. I was also, I was 17. I was the youngest DJ to do a, a, a club night in the in Dubai. Oh, wow. The legal age to DJ 18. is 21. Oh, wow. 21. Oh, yes. Okay. I 
we won't get into the specifics of uh, how you and how I got in, but I was the youngest official DJ to have his own night once a week in a nightclub in Dubai at the age of 17. And that the reason I say not to raise boys is because it can be so hedonistic that it pulls, you know, us males, we're more tendent to throw ourselves into yep. shenanigans than a female. Would. Yeah, agreed. You know what I mean? That's why I say if a boy is raised there, he'll be raised soft and you won't appreciate. Yeah. I had a hard time adapting when I came back, truth be told. That's why I always When you say came back after prison? After prison. Okay, so let's pause right there. Now let's tell us from 17 being a DJ, enjoying Dubai life. That's the, exactly where it all kicks off. Where did you go wrong? What happened? <laughs> like, okay, fair enough. You like to party. You may be like to be in you know what you do the talking what happened how did you go from being the youngest dj ever to being the only person from the uk on death row because we're both sitting here with a smile on our face because <laughs> thank god you're here thank but god what the fuck like man to man <laughs> what went wrong is honestly uh, a mixture of events that i didn't even see coming uh it was by the grace of God that I'm actually sitting here right now. And you, you, the viewers, will all understand why. 17, DJing, making about 300 pound an hour, yeah. which is very, in dirhams, that's like 1,200. I was making good money. In dirhams, it's... That's times 5.5. 5. Yeah. So I'm just over a grand, making good money as a 17-year-old, you know. I would never get cars on my own. I had one vehicle on my name registered, yeah. but I'd always lease other cars on okay, yeah, yeah. different names. So one weekend, I'd be in a G55. I was living like... At what age? 17. Just turned 18 because of the license. The license, okay. So you live in life. Yeah. One weekend, it was the 911 Turbo. One weekend, a G55. All on lease because I don't want anything coming back yeah, to yeah, my name. Course. Bear in mind, I did not even have a bank account at this stage. Oh, wow. So money was kept in my glove compartment in a, in a Skoda Fabia. <laughs> but it's safe. Safe. That's another point. You can fall asleep on a bench in Dubai with a million on your lap. And you're waking up with probably a million or more. A million or more. Someone's left you a few yeah, extra Because they thought you were homeless. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's leave them some dates and yeah. some juice. So, um, <laughs> 17... Got into it, making good money. And as you know, in a club, who do people tend to go to to look for naughty things? The DJ. Okay. Yeah. If not the bartender, the, the DJ. DJ. Me being the... Jack the you lad. Know, yeah, you know, always down for a sh bit of shenanigans. One, two people came to me. Have you got a bit of this? Have you got a bit of that? No, sorry, no, sorry. A week, two, three weeks later, one of my mates goes, oh, I've got a link, link. to this. I said, what, link to what? Yeah. He said, I told him hash, like, you know, weed, a bit of smoke. He said, no, bro, cocaine. I said, you know, that's a big no-no in Dubai. I said, yeah. no one... No, no one fucks I've, with that. I, I told him personally, I've never... The only other case before, like a major cocaine case before me yeah. was one in 2005. And that was, I'm not going to say his name, but he owned an exotic uh, automobile showroom and they smuggled... Um, cocaine in Lamborghini tires oh wow yeah okay if you I'll show you the articles later off camera yeah. <laughs> but basically before then there was no major cocaine cocaine was not a thing not a thing at all so they've been waiting since 2005 till 2013 for someone to come along with a cocaine case so anyway you know my mate too because I've got a nice link uh my dad his dad at the time owned a import export electronics uh, okay. firm from China yeah I told him, so how are we going to do this? I said, you know, cocaine equals South America. Where does China come into this equation? <laughs> yeah. no, was, he goes, no, 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 you don't know what's going on these days. He said, it's all different now. There's more money made in, uh, you know, there's no more money. Everyone knows more money made in transporting drugs than using, making. Well. Okay. So he goes to me, I've got a different plan. I'm bringing it in through my father's trade license on his import-export company. And I've got one of his men in the factory doing wow. all my dirty work for me, putting it in the PlayStation boxes, wires, copper. I said, okay. But this time I was just like, you know, taking all this information in and I'm thinking... You didn't oh, even think anything of yeah, it. Yeah, I didn't really think just anything Just an idea. Of. Yeah. I said, cool, you know. Anyway, Whatever. a few days later, matey gets his... Shipment. Yeah. Gives me a call and says, 
you're DJing, you're DJing here and there tonight, aren't you? You got a few. I said, yeah. He said, why don't you, you know, take some? Said, yeah, take some. Sell have it. a bit of fun. I told him, look, I'll take some. I'll try it myself and see how it goes. Yeah. You know, I, was like, I don't want to jump straight into yeah. the. <laughs> yeah. I'll be 19, practically still a teenager. Yeah. Um, a few bits here and there. I was like, oh, do you know what? This is not bad. Are and we, was people in Dubai at this time doing cocaine? Was it available? Was it something if you wanted to get, you could have got it? Not easily. So at that time, a very specific, I won't say elite. Okay. Yeah. I'll say very high end people who are allowed to come into the country and not have their baggage searched. If you know that yeah. type of people, yeah. those were the ones that had it. Okay. Yeah. But those people aren't the ones in the first place. They're not call selling me it. and you or yeah, ask yeah. her, can I get a... They've got yeah, their yeah. own arrangements, you know what I mean? Okay. So it was a very hush-hush thing. Like I said, it was mostly weeds, little class Bs, the pills, yeah, yeah. bits and bobs. Um, so my man from China started picking up his things and, and then he told me, look, why don't you try, you know, selling it into the club? Okay, and yeah. Then we can start something out. I told him, all right, I'll have a think about it. And this, is, this was my mistake. And before I get into anything, this is just a little disclaimer. Dubai is a city of the future, a city of security. Like I know people and I have family, friends and close people that live there till today that I communicate with on a daily basis. And I don't fault them. They did their due diligence, you know, to get to the bottom of whatever was going on. Yeah. I had my fair share of mistakes. They've had their fair share of mistakes you know but that's one thing i want to get out of the way that everything i'm about to explain is for my own this isn't a dubai is a bad no, video this is simply all. you expressing your story my story my mistakes and how it led up to what it led to exactly going from there it went well for 17 turned 18 so for a year it was a bit of i wasn't really involved involved but, you know, bits and bobs here and there. I wasn't yeah. taking it seriously. By the time I turned 18 and I was like, got the license, I was driving all over the place. I thought, right, car, connections. I can make this DJing. work. I was like, I can make this work. Making good money DJing. The greed, this is where I'm saying, this is where the hedonistic black hole started opening. Yeah. And that's where I put my first leg in, second leg in, and it sucked me in. Next thing you know, I was like, yeah, bro, I was going up, let's do it, blah, blah, blah. And it just became a little system, like a, yeah, a little, systematic. A way for you to make some money. And, and how much was, I don't know, how much, how was you selling out there? Grams? Uh, in grams. And how much was a gram? So standard price here in the UK, first, last time I checked, was about you get half a gram for 40 quid. Okay. Right? And Which out there? In Durham's, five times four. 200. 200, 220. But what was it? Was that the same price or no? no? Okay. Over there. A gram yeah. was 2,000 dirhams. Wow. So, so half a gram was 100 pounds. So, so 400, 350, 400, just under 400 quid. For a gram? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And people were paying. So 10 times the price? Yeah, almost. Yeah. And well, if it's 40 quid for hot, no. 20 times the price. Basically. Fuck me. Oh, wow. Okay. And the, and the people that started showing up to buy these products. People with money had money at the beginning it started off as like you know under the dj booth yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. then i was like no because you start making contacts in the club you know you see yeah. a, a guy come dressed well talking to you in a certain manner different than the, the other people you can tell he's coming to you and sloshed out of his face you know slurring and so you start building a little clientele and stuff like that and you know making networking and you know, people coming in decent cars dressed very decently discreet business owners be, you know, highs, proper people. Yeah, proper people. And I thought, right, you know, I've taken this from the ghetto gully and I've managed to elevate it. My mate's happy. Everything's going good. And at this point, I never thought, the thought of getting caught is never on your mind. Yeah. You, it you, isn't until you get caught. No, literally. It's always like that. I'm living life. It got to a point where I stopped asking my family for a single penny for about two years. You know, my father got suspicious at of one course. point. He, he come up to me, he's like, son, you haven't asked me for a penny or anything <laughs> for about two years. Have you, what's going on? Yeah. Have, you, have you like gone off the grid or have you doing... I told him, no, I'm all good. DJing, DJing is covering it and, you know, work yeah. and all that. He's like, all right, all right. 
You know, he, he knew something's up, but he never knew. Didn't want to bust my bubble, kind of in a way. But he, he wasn't he wasn't aware of the severity of the situation. Roll down a few months, someone gets caught. Okay. Someone gets caught by the Dubai Narcotics Agency. Now, okay. we all know how the UAE is seven Emirates combined. Mm -hmm. Dubai, Sharjah, Ajman. But we all know Dubai is the, even though Abu Dhabi is the capital, everyone talks about Dubai. Yeah. So it began with an investigation from a friend of a friend that got caught. Was he part of the circle, part of that? He wasn't even part of our circle, nothing. Okay. He got caught for something completely, ir completely irrelevant. Drug related? Uh, yeah. Okay. Drug related offence. And I'll never forget this. I, I got a phone call from him once. Uh, I was having lunch with my father and I got a phone call from him and I picked up the phone and he sounded very, you know, nervous. And he said, yeah, I've got a friend with me just who wants to have a quick chat with you. Uh, I thought, you know, it might help, you know, make some yeah. networking, some business. And I said, what is it about? He said, yeah, he wants some stuff. Uh, I thought, oh, all right. Okay. Phone. Hello. Straight away, I knew it was just, uh, undercover place. Oh, like, shit, really? Yeah, you knew as well? Like, yeah, straight away. Like, from the accent, from the Arabic. Yeah, yeah. Bear in mind, like, also, I speak fluent Arabic. So, when he started talking to me in that... F in, no one... See, in Dubai, no Arab, local Arab, will directly come to you... And For buy. anything? No. They will never... It's, it's shameful. Yeah. So, they'll go through the through someone else. friend or through... Yeah. The fact that I had... A local. A local speaking to me. Ask me that. That put a red flag in my head. I said, I don't know what you're on about. Thank you, mate. Blah, blah. Hang up. And that was eight months before... You got arrested. The big day. From that day forward, little did I know... You was under investigation. Yeah, they started like, as they say, like in America, an indictment. They started putting names together, you know, pinpointing. That guy gave my mate's name, mate's name. Your turned name. Turned into a train. Next thing I know... Eight months later, um, the guy who initially uh, started this with, who approached me, said, look, uh, we've got a, we need to leave Dubai and come to the Emirate that's right across the border, Sharjah. Okay. Have you heard of Sharjah? Yeah, yeah. Even stricter. Oh, really? They're yeah. stricter now, than Sharjah Dubai. are known to be hardcore. Okay. Like, you guys can Google yourselves and see. Like you get caught stealing, they chop your fingers off? By, by by Sharia law, yeah, but they don't okay. do it. Okay, okay. On paper, yeah. Okay. So it is... It's strict. Yeah. It's just place you don't fuck around, yeah. <coughs> you don't, like, if uh, be honest with you, I would have rather done my time in the Dubai central prison then than the Sharjah. Sharjah one. But the case started in Dubai. Okay. But you'll understand why I did my time in Sharjah. Um, eight months later, uh, I get a call from uh, one of our close friends who was in the circle, you know, never doubted him, considered him like a brother... Call and says, hey, how's it going? What are you guys doing tonight? Let's go out. Let's have a bit of fun. And uh, I said, yeah, sure. Let's, let's do, do it. it. You know, let's go out. Where are you going? So at this point, you have no idea you're under investigation. No Life is normal. Life is absolutely normal. Okay. And a funny thing is, at this point, though, something in me started, like, beeping, telling me... Maybe that's enough. Yeah, maybe that's enough. You know, when you... Humans have a hole that we can never fill. Yeah. And I truly believe that. And once you're in that hedonistic black hole, it's hard to get out of it because you just want more and more and more. Uh, I saw it as an opportunity, I'll yeah. be honest. Uh, greed kicked in and he said, look, I've got a big buyer who wants to meet your friend. Bear in mind, I wasn't the face of any of this. So how high up on the food chain was you? So the guy who was bringing it in from China, he was obviously the boss. Yep. Underneath him was his brother... And then underneath, you could say, was me. Okay, so you weren't, you were up there. I, I was up there, but I wasn't The man, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Um, next thing I know, I get a phone call from one of the guys who was in the group. He says, guys, I've got a quick sale. Actually, I had, I had, I had, I had to DJ that night. And um, I told him, look, I don't have time for this. He says, no, 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 please, please, please. Extremely urgent. It's life or death, mate. I really need this to be done today. I said, who is this person that needs this so urgently right mm -hmm. now? He said, oh, it's just a, a mate of mine. You don't know him. I said, who? He said, oh, it's just one of the local blokes. I said, oh, no, not again. He said, please, you know, you know when your mate keeps nagging you, yeah, it's yeah. like, all right, toss it. Yeah. 
He goes, can you meet me in this place? I said, we'd never meet at this place. He said, no, but you know, just because the traffic, blah, blah. He started making all you know, strange excuses. I said, all right, then we'll take a drive. So I told my mate, uh, listen, we're going to go meet him there. He said, why? He started getting suspicious himself. I told him, look, we, we, we haven't got time. Let's hurry up. And this mm -hmm. is the mistake. When you start cutting corners, That's and thinking, you yeah, up. it's fine. You know, <coughs> got away late. Let's hurry up. We went to the place where we were supposed to meet up with. Bear in mind now, I admit, I had consumed, right? Okay. On the way there, I had a little baggie. No more than like maybe a point two. Done a few lines. I consumed. It was in my blood system. Yeah. There was an empty baggie that fell on the floor, under my shoe, somewhere under the mat. Literally traces. Yeah, yeah. Passenger with me, physically on him, had about quarter kilo of crystal meth, and about a band of ten to fifteen thousand dirhams. So, baggies on the floor. I done my bit. Now, bear you're in mind, thinking the bag's empty. There's nothing wrong. Bag's here. empty. There's nothing in my pocket. I'm riding in a vehicle for him to do his transaction. Yep. Right. We're driving. We're driving. We're driving. We're supposed to meet in Dubai. Out of nowhere, he calls me and says, "Change your plan. We're meeting on the border, right between Dubai and Sharjah." Okay. Right. There's this street that literally differentiates between Dubai and Sharjah. So if you get so, what on, side are you on? So right now, he wanted me to go on the Sharjah side. Okay. Reason being is, we didn't know that this mate of ours had been caught by the Sharjah narcotics. Okay, so they want you arrested in Sharjah. In Sharjah. And I've got an investigation from Dubai already investigating us. Okay. So it got to a point where both, both agencies found out and said, right, let's do this together. And wherever, which emirate they end up in, which city they end up in. That's who keeps him. That's who keeps him. They first tried to get me in Dubai. Luckily... When we stopped, we parked the car in Dubai. Before he told me, let's go meet in Sharjah, we parked the car in Dubai and he goes, have you got anything to sample on now? The reason he said that is because the laws in Dubai is wherever your possession is, uh -huh. that is where you spend your time. And if you have possession, you get a completely different treatment than if it was just usage or if it was... Okay, yeah, so yeah, for yeah. Every, makes sense. You know, for every type of... Um, uh, Send, um, for every type of prosecution prosecution, or for every type of case that they're trying to basically inflict on you, it varies. So they wanted me to get me in Dubai. reason they wanted to get me in Dubai was they were hoping that it was a hand-to-hand -hand transaction. Hand-to-hand yeah. -hand transaction is an automatic 25 to life in Dubai. Wow. That's what they wanted. Luckily, when I got out of the car and went into the undercover, I have no clue that this is undercover police. My mate is sitting with an undercover in the car pretending to be sweet as you know introducing yeah. me to an undercover undercover is talking to me like he's your uh, mate yeah and i still have some dodgy feelings but you know when you're in that buzz and you're young you're reckless you don't care it is what it is it's what it is i got in the car and then the undercover turns to me and says so where's uh, where's my little sample i said no nah, it's nothing to do with me i said part mate he's in the car over there he's got it he said all right can you bring me a little something just a sample now and mm -hmm. then we'll move you know, and then we'll go get the rest from another place. They want to drive us, you know, they want to get us here and they want to get us yeah, in charge. Yeah. They, don't just, they want to just make the case as big as possible. So I got out of the car and I went back into our car, my mate's car, and I told him, look, these guys are asking for a little sample, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's like, tell them to just get lost. I don't have time for this. Do they want to buy or not? Yeah. Thank God he said that because if he had pulled out a little sample and I got out of that car and got back into that car, I would have handed it to him and it would have been then and there, hand to hand transaction. Twenty five years to life, life Done. and I would I wouldn't be sitting here right now. Okay, I ended up on death row instead. <laughs> but <laughs> wow, when he saw that that didn't work, he said, "Right, do you mind then following me to uh, just down the road to Sharjah, and instead doing the transaction there?" I thought, "Why?" He said, "That's closer to my house, and since you're not willing to uh, give, me a give me a sample here, might as well go near my house." I said, "All right." drove down we got to the area so now technically we're not on dubai borders anymore wow second but we, up but until here you haven't actually broken the law yet technically no okay yeah they haven't got anything on me nothing to arrest you nothing for. nothing to yet. arrest me for yet 
We get to the point where he, they want us now. We park the car. They come park beside us. And usually it's always window to window. Yeah, yeah. Chuck, chuck. To, he goes, no, come get in. Let's, let's have a little chill. I said, no, I haven't got time for this. We go, you know, I need to move. He said, no, 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 no. He insists. He's like, just come in, have a quick seat. You know, just have a quick try. I said, no, man, I don't. I'm busy. He said, oh, please, please, please. I said, all right. Oh, that was it, the biggest go. mistake. Got out the car, hopped into their car. Next thing I know, he puts it in reverse, flies out, and starts speeding away from my mate's car. I'm like, where are you going? He goes, no, no, don't worry. We're just going to take a spin around the block. What car were they in? Lexus LS450, I'll never forget. Okay. <clears throat> black on black, tinted windows, everything. I said, why are you going so fast? I said, uh, I'm just, here it is, mate. Just, you know, let's hurry up. He goes, no, 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 no. don't worry. I'll, I'll just take in a quick round and I'll bring you back. Drives down, far away from where I was parked. Car stops. And I go, why are we stopped here? He goes, uh, this is where I knew everything hit the fan. My... Mate, who sat in the front seat, who set us up, looks at him, undercover looks at him, pulls a headset off the rear view mirror and goes, in Arabic, goes, move, move, move. Next thing I know, the back two doors open. I've got punches coming into my face. I was wearing a gold chain at the time. Rips it off, ties it around his fist. I'm getting battered left and right. Oh, shit, really? Yeah. They took the heads then... At the same time, so at the same, literally, same moment, they had another vehicle go to my mate who was parked down the road. Same thing. Same thing. They want to obviously separate us. Next thing I know, the, head, the, the headrest of the car has been taken off. I'm being battered with the headrest, right? Oh, shit. Handcuffed. I can't, my face is black and blue at this point. Where's, where's the rest of the drive? Where's this? Where's the money? I said, what am I? We're going to search your car. We're going to find out. Search, fine. Search the car. They found, on my side, the empty baggie. They took us back to narcotics department. I said, in Sharjah? In Sharjah now. Okay. They said, we've got you in Sharjah. I said, why am I not being taken? Because I know that in Dubai, they're more lenient to an extent than Sharjah. I was hoping to get my case transferred to Dubai. They said, no, you got caught just over the border. Sorry, buddy, you're stuck with us now. Wow. Said, Shit. From there... Black hoodie on. I don't know where I'm going. Is this what they, how they treat you? Yeah, from, the, from that moment, after the few couple of punches, the headrest, the headrest gets put back on and I've got a black hoodie on my head. I don't know where I'm going. Uh, they take us to the, what they call the narcotics detention center. Now, that is where they keep you until they have, they gather enough evidence. Yeah. See, this is, this is where it all goes wrong. Like, most countries, most places, you're innocent until proven guilty. Over there, no, we catch you, we keep you, and then we start doing our due diligence and whatever we find will. Uh, I got extended from a three-day hold to a week. A week became 30 days, 30 days, 60, and so forth. Bear in mind, in this uh, detention center, it's a two-by-four cell. I couldn't even lie down straight. You had wow. to slit, like, dial Curl your body up. Curl your body up. They, as soon as I got there, they obviously, they stripped me naked, fully naked, and they go, right, you're going to do this the easy way or the hard way? I said, well, what does that mean? They said, well, you either give us a urine test right now and uh, give us access to your phone and your source. I said, well, what source? What? Yeah, I'm not yeah. importing nothing. I'm just, you know, a guy in the middle. Dealing this and that. Yeah, he's here and there, you know. He said, no, 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 we know what's going on. We've been following you. I said, oh. And truth is, they did make it bigger than what it seemed. Like, I'm, I admit, you know, I was, yeah. I have my fair share of mistakes, but it was like a bit of a golden mine for them at the time. So I get thrown in the two by four cell for two days. No one comes and talks. So to what me. did you do? Easy way or hard way? <laughs> hard way. Okay. Because I, see, I thought first by not giving the uh, urine test and the blood test, hopefully I can pull it off where... It'll come out negative, yeah. hopefully get out of it. I thought 0 0.03 possession ain't going to be much. Little did I know that that was not the case at all. Um, six, seven, eight hours into being into that cell, they'll come knocking the door. You ready to give us a test? No. Nope. No. Okay. Six hours later. You ready? No. Okay. 12, 12 hours go by. You're not, you're not going to give us a test? No. All right. 
two minutes later, two balaclava guys come in and they do this uh, like fear factor. They try like good cop, bad cop. Not only good, no, I wish. Bad cop, bad cop. Okay. They come in, two balaclava uh, narcotic agents come in. Same hooded black on your hair, hoodie again on your head. You can't see where you're going. They start dragging you around. And uh, they take me into a freezing cold room, right? Okay. Freezing cold. Strip me naked, right? And obviously my head still, I can't, I don't, I can't see anything. And all I hear is dripping water and like a hose of some sort and cold water being like splashed onto me and I'm handcuffed backwards. And suddenly I hear dzz, dzz, electric, yeah. like an electric current. Right? And he goes, look, if you don't give us this willingly, yeah. we'll make you piss yourself and we will gather your piss off the floor and take it and we will put a case on you. Raw. And he said, if not, you see these 20 guys here with me, they'll run a train on you and I'll still make sure I get my urine test off you. Swear to me that is what happened. 19, standing there naked, handcuffed back with uh, him holding the electric copper wire cold water dripping on me telling me choose piss yourself or i'll have 20 guys run a train on you wow yeah. is that what happens over there wow in that situation i thought to myself right what can i what's the best how am i gonna what's the best outcome what can i do here i said i told them i can't uh, i told them look I can't, I'll give you the test. At this point, I said, look, I'll give you the urine Definitely. test. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I'll give you the test, but not like this. Yeah. I said, uncuff me. Let me have a bit of water. You know, let me do it normally. Yeah. So they sat there, they, they uncuffed me, put me back down, put me back in the cell. And then this time he comes in with two bottles of water and he's like, you're going to drink these, like two liter bottles of right water. Right now. And he's like, you're going to drink this in front of me right now. Chugged like four liters of water in the span of like four and a half minutes. 15 minutes later, mate, I'm a bum. <laughs> burst, <laughs> right? And I'm sat there, shackled, and they don't, you're shackled and handcuffed at all times. Legs, yeah, ankles, yeah. and. And he goes, You ready? I'm like, Maybe. Have to be. He can see. And um, I'm like, Maybe. He goes, Look, you can play this as long as you want. He said, Worst case scenario, we'll just take you down to the hospital, we'll put a catheter in, and we'll pull it out. He said, We've got all our. At that point, I was like, do you know what? They're going to get yeah, you. I, need to. I said, do you know what? Take me, take me to the loo. <laughs> Comes in with a jar. Stands right in front of you. Fuck yeah, Do man. your thing. Piss in the pot. I told him, here's your piss. <laughs> yeah. Took the test. They chucked me back in that two by four cell for three days. Three days. No one's talking to me. No one's nothing. All I hear, and bear in mind, all this time, they've segregated us from our case partners. I don't yeah. know who said what. Little did I know in the meantime, they've been uh, taking their statements. They threw the book on me. And when it came to my turn to sit with the prosecution, I was the last one to sit with the prosecution. So you're already fucked. I'm already down, like pretty much done and dusted. I sat down and they said, look, your friends have said one, two, three, four, five. It's all coming from you. They're local citizens. They uh, are, you know, children of the country. They're not uh, out here to uh, do this kind of thing. You're the foreigner who's trying to corrupt our children and our society. Uh, it's all on you. They're just innocent, basically uh, users. They'll get a mild sentence. You're taking the rap. Prosecutor said it straight to my face. So I said, when, at that point, I thought, I'm screwed. Yeah. Take me out the prosecution and then the lawyer now this is one of my biggest mistakes was it came down to now choosing solicitors and lawyers i unfortunately did the mistake of taking a, choosing a different lawyer rather than having all of us take one lawyer okay yeah, if yeah. we were all under the same lawyer and solicitor and same legal team they would have fought for all of us i went my own way because i thought right they're throwing the book at me so let me prep on my own you know, and do my own thing. Yeah. That was a mistake because what did their lawyer do? He used that as an advantage and leverage and said, look, he's got something, he's got his own lawyer. So their lawyer then started 
doing the defense, more of the case. exactly building it against me. My clients are innocent. Blah blah blah. Even though there was a quarter kilo of crystal meth in his pocket and stacks of cash. Long story short, we get sent to a detention center. Now we leave the narcotics department and we get sent to a detention center, which is where they hold you until you actually see a judge. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you get caught with possession, you're classified as high risk. Mm -hmm. If you get caught with no possession, but like just consumption, yeah. you're not high risk. They considered that 0 0.03 as high risk. Oh, wow. So when I was taken into that um, temporary custody holding before they send you to the central jail, they, they take me in and they're like, right, we've got a wing for Asians, a wing for Arabs, a wing for, you know, Africans, a wing they try and always keep you know they don't Everyone, have trouble mixing yeah, yeah, up yeah, yeah, yeah. and i go right what about me <laughs> you know yeah. they go you go in this one i'm like what's this one they put me in with the mental health like the alcoholics who are oh, um, trying to you know the um, people going through cold turkey yeah, yeah, yeah. people who are delusional drink driving and still out of the worst possible route of wing yeah. basically my case partners got the nice cushy chilled relaxed five star <laughs> so i was like, all right no problem got in there um there's always a foreman whenever every wing's got a foreman so i went in I what's said, a foreman the foreman basically is the prisoner that's the boss of the, the boss wing. of the wing yeah okay he like he's the liaison between you and the police okay yeah yeah any issues any usually they're snitches nine out of ten times yeah. <laughs> um i went in i told him what's the story you know i'm Clearly, my mates are there, blah, 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 blanket, where can I sort myself out? He goes, look, mate, there's 40 of us in here. We take turns sleeping, you, half an hour standing, an hour on the floor, literally, because there was no place. There was about 65 of us yeah. taking turns sleeping, standing. You and sleep then, standing? Yeah. So on the wall, leaning on the corner, so all four corners had one guy, one guy, one guy. And then that was four guys. And then we had about another 50 odd. Leaning up against each other. Leaning constantly. up against each other, head to, to, to feet. You know what I mean? We were literally like sardines and we'd take turns standing. Then you could lie down. Shit. Did that for about two weeks until finally, because I was high risk, they said, we need to transfer from here because you're high risk. You have possession. We're going to send you to central jail. To me, that was like, oh, thank God, you know, at least yeah. this is, I can't spend more time here. It's a temporary. Put me on a bus. We're going to the central jail now. And as soon as we get to the central jail, they open the gates. We go in and they sit us down. And they're like, right, they're basically, you know, sorting us out. Yeah, Who's yeah. murder? Murder come this way. Picture taken, case number, mug shots, all that. And as soon as I walked in, first thing uh, one of the uh, guards says to me is, uh, I was only 19 at the time, so facial hair wasn't even. Yeah. He goes to me, good luck to you when you go in there. I said, what do you mean? He said, you'll see. And this is in Sharjah? Yeah. So he said, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna have fun with you. I said, really? I said, all right, no worries. Trying to intimidate me. Yeah, yeah. We sat down. They take your fingerprints, blah blah. blah. And um, I was sitting next to this guy who um, who was in for murder. And believe it or not, murderers are some of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Okay. Like out of everyone that I spent time with in that place, probably I'd say the murderers. You'd be surprised. Are the most compassionate people to an extent. They have their. It's like a switch. I've learned. A lot of people have this compassion in them that just they don't show. And my time there just showed me that murderers actually have some of the most empathy. Yeah. Anyway, we get taken in there. They're trying to sort us out. Drugs here, drug cases there, murder. There, there, this. Put us in groups and they take us into the wings. And basically they, they look at me and they say, you technically should go in this ward which has smaller sentences you know minor okay, stuff yeah. because you're not sentenced yet and then the uh the head uh, guard on duty goes no 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 send him to ward five i'm like what's ward five he goes ward five is the death row i said death what row. yeah i was like what i was like why he said your uh, your case is a death row uh, case 
I said, what do you mean? I said, he said, you're a class A, he said, possession, and uh, possession with intent to supply. I said, intent to supply what? He said, yeah, that bag, uh, the baggy under your foot was basically, we know that that was f intent supply, and we know that what was with your friend was actually your, they started putting, yeah, yeah. I said, I was in shock at this point, do you know what I mean? I thought this has got to be a joke. So they sent me into the death row ward. As soon as I walk in And there, at this point, have you had any contact with your family yet? No, not one. Nothing. I wasn't allowed to fo So bear in mind, this has been now almost... A month. Three weeks. Okay. Um, I haven't had one phone call with my family. My family think I'm... Um, missing. Uh, miss so no one even knows you've been arrested, nothing no, at all? No. But there was one point right before they took my phone where I managed to send some absolutely gibberish quick message to my father. Yeah. He, when he got that, he, he understood knew. something's not right. Yeah. He made a few phone calls, blah, blah, found out. Okay. So at least they rest assured that, you know, yeah, my yeah. son's not dead. Um, well, by the time they took not us... Not far off. Yeah. <laughs> they take us into the central jail, in the death row ward. I go in. As soon as I walk in, it's like typical. Everyone's looking, new meat, you know, like, who's this? What's that? Everyone starts coming and talking to you. Luckily, I speak fluent Arabic. Yeah. If I didn't... You would have been finished. I would have been screwed. So first thing I did was, you know, I just took my blanket, my pillow, I'm sitting in the corner, you know, straight face. Uh, and then a few guys come and approach, what's your case, blah, blah, blah. How many people were in there? Was it a big, was it a lot of people? Yeah. So in that ward itself, that death row ward, we had about 45 people. See, no one ever hears of that in Dubai. No. No one ever hears of people getting arrested. No. No one hears of people on death row. No. Now, this is the funny part now. When I thought it's all like, you know, over, suddenly out of nowhere, they come, call me on the microphone, say, make your way to the, um, leave the ward and make your way to the main reception area. Okay. So I go there and I find basically they've got their own like special forces, police in, in the prison. Oh shit. They do the dirty work kind of. Yeah. They're the balaclava guys who do the raids, the, the cell searches, they come in with the dogs, all that. So I, I was just about to get comfy, do you know what I mean? And uh, suddenly I hear my name on the microphone. I go, what's up? I find two guys masked up, shackles, handcuffs, and they're like, come. Well, what's going on? They're like, uh, you're, high uh, you're high risk. You need to go to the holding area to make sure that you're not carrying anything. I said, carrying anything? I said, I've already been for three weeks in holding. and that, yeah. what, what could I be carrying? They said, no, this is how it is. I said, why only me? No, just get in. I said, all right. Once again, black hoodie on the head. I'm like, right, oh, this is getting much now. Next thing I know, I'm getting thrown in a minivan. And what they do is like terrorizing antics. They drive you around the prison, handbrake turn, you're in the back of a van being swung around. Oh, seriously? Yeah, they're screaming, they're trying to intimidate you. Do you know what I mean? You're being thrown around, shackled, handcuffed. Scare tactics, you know, just trying to break you down. After that, they don't drop you back to your ward. They take you to what they call the execution cells. Now, that is where they put you in the last, your last 24 hours before they execute you. They put you there. It's your last meal, yeah. your last everything. They put you in there on purpose, so you hear the people getting executed every day. Wow. So I was in there for a couple of days, right? And they turn, once again, they turn the temperature on like sub-zero, and it's freezing, and they'll turn on xenon lights on the ceiling, you can't sleep, mad. And you can hear people screaming, you can hear people every other day getting executed because they on purposely do that to you. To, to scare you more. Scare you. And after a couple of days in there, they break you down and then they're like, you ready to go back now to your ward? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> please. <laughs> Once again, hooded, same antics again in the van, blah, blah, blah. They take me back. This time they've let me into the ward, I go in. Um, this time the guys, when I walked in, they're like, ah, did they give you the special treatment? I'm like, yeah, okay, he's like, it's yeah. all right, we all get it, blah, blah, blah. Luckily, I knew a, a friend of a friend's cousin was there by coincidence. Yeah. He's like, ah, what are you doing here? Blah, blah, blah. Come to my bunk, it's all good. So that did help a lot because if, if I hadn't known anyone, it would have been much harder. Like, breaking the ice and all these people have been in there, especially in that ward, when you're on death row, like, 
they've all been there for five, six years minimum. Wa- wa- so waiting it's, it's to home to them. It's home to them. Yeah. You're some new guy here on a retreat, to the, in their opinion. Th- yeah. This is their home. Uh, everything, they, the smallest things can tick anyone off. It turns into a petty, a petty party. You start arguing over why did you use my kettle? Yeah, you know, yeah, you yeah, start because you have nothing else to fight about. So I, I found my way, you know, I started slowly, you know, settling in, got a bunker. And uh, I remember my first time I had a proper, proper interaction or a fight, you could say, or argument was obviously when you first go to jail, you're used to your outside voice. You know, it's really yeah. loud, in prison, you can't. Like, you've got to be, shh, shh, especially in that war. Oh, really, yeah? People have been there for years and they, res- they want their silence. They want their quietness. So there I am walking up and down, you know loud mouth and some guy comes out opens the door why are you yelling your voice who do you think you are you're new here on the win grabs me but shit kicks off in like the first two days uh i get sent again solitary for no reason that guy doesn't get sent anywhere i do a couple of days there back again finally my lawyer comes and sees me in about a month and i haven't even had any representation or sat on my lawyer so finally after a month in my lawyer comes sits down with me tells me look it's not looking good. They're trying to pin you down for everything. Distribu- everything, distribution, this, that, criminal organization. Nothing that I was genuinely even to do with. So he said, look, just hang in there. We're going to do our best. Um, we'll get you out ASAP. Uh, hopefully your trial should start soon. Went in, first hearing, judge tells me your charges are um, distribution of a class A uh, or blah 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 threw the whole book at me and I'm just that my mum sat in the courtroom crying and I'm you know do you do you, do you, uh, do you admit do you you know are you aware of your uh, charges, uh, what charges you've done. blah 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 yes yes you know at first I tried to pull the uh, I didn't know it was illegal <laughs> uh, and um, I I said yeah I mean you know I, I I did what I did, but I'm not some Pablo Escobar trying to, yeah, you yeah. know, take over. Back to the prison. A few months later, the thing is, they don't keep you in the loop on purpose because they don't want you to, know, don't what's want you to know what's going, going on. on. And bear in mind, they, 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 they on purposely scatter you and, you know, you put yourself Just to model and, you up exactly, as well. Exactly, because they don't want your stories to line up. Next time I go to court, the witnesses, who are my case partners, are stood there Giving witness against you, giving evidence yeah, against you. in front of me. When we were on the bus together saying, yeah, well, he's like, don't worry, bro, we got this. Well, we got there in front of the judge and he's just like, yeah, same, same. Wow, well, wow, wow. I, I'm just, uh, right. I'm fucked. Yeah, I'm fucked. After that hearing, my case partner's lawyer, who's not even my lawyer, right? He has no, like, no loyalty to you. No loyalty to me. Goes up to one of my family friends uh, who was in court and tells him, look, I shouldn't tell you this, but he's getting 25 to, uh, if he's lucky to get off death row, he'll probably get 25 to life. About you? Yeah. Then my mom found out, my mom broke down and she didn't want to tell me that obviously, eventually she did. Uh, from that moment forward, I thought, right, do you know what? If I'm going to be here for the rest of my life, I need to get comfy, comfy. I need to adapt. I need to do the, make the most of it. Picked up a Quran and I said, I better get comfy. Start reading the Quran, start praying my five days of prayer, five uh, prayers a day. And I started thinking to myself and thinking, reflecting back, you know, the more I spent time in there, I realized I'm not leaving anytime soon. I had a lot of hope I'm going to get out next week, I'm going to get out tomorrow, no bail, this, that. And I could see it was getting serious 25 for the death row, 25 to life. 25 to life might be my best option, blah, blah, blah. So I started getting very invested into my faith. Yeah. And honestly speaking, that is what kept me going throughout that phase. It was a total of four years I spent in there. In those four years, the first year is a bit of a shock. You don't take it in. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's just so, time just, it don't go quick, but I can imagine it's just more, you're waiting for, am I coming out? Something. There's two types of people. There's the type that goes in yeah. and gets acquainted quick in prison, blah, 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 you know, and absorbs it all in. And then there's the type that goes in. And they need to process it, hit, it. Yeah, and then it hits them later. I was processing, but after a year, 
it hit me. I was like, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. And then that's where it hit me. My father then, when he saw, you know, I'm not going nowhere, he started a heavy, heavy media campaign. And I don't blame him. You know, his yeah. son's locked up. He started the heavy media campaign. Why is my son being thrown in solitary every other day? Why is he being mistreated compared to the, his case partners? Blah, blah, blah. Why, bear in mind, beating, time of arrest, I had guns pointed to my head, all sorts. He said, why, why was he you know, put through this when his case partners wouldn't? When he had practically no possession on him, no money was found, no nothing. Something was in his system, fair enough, you know. So he, he, he did the, I mean... He'd done his best that any father could to try and get his son out. My mother, on the other hand, didn't agree so much. My mom was the, she had the approach of keep your head down, go through it, soldier through it, and don't piss them off, and they'll let you out kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And she did have a point, because the second that media campaign kicked off... They got worse for you. It got worse. And so obviously, the second the media campaign went live mm. how did your treatment change it changed for the better and for the worst okay better because the prison knew that there were eyes on me the british embassy were coming and visiting me every oh they were yeah? yeah they were they were visiting me they could have done better but they were there for me at the same time yeah you know they come visit are you okay drop me a few books blah 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 do you need anything Healthcare. i was not getting any health care I was getting ill, ear, eye infections. The, the place is f filthy, Dirty. mate. Filthy. Everyone's got lice. And there I am, like, trying to get medical attention. No one's they giving don't give a shit. So one day, I just absolutely lost the plot. I went to the, <laughs> I went to the guard. I told him, look, if you don't let me out to the, uh, to the doctors right now, to the clinic, I just, yeah, I can't have it anymore. Are you going to let me out? He's like, no, you're fine. I said, okay. Went to the phone. I called the embassy. I said, look, I'm extremely ill. I'm about to collapse. I've got this, uh, an eye infection. I can't even see straight. This guy won't even let me go to a clinic. Within five minutes, there was a phone call <laughs> calling me to the clinic. Did you phone UK embassy or Dubai embassy? The Dubai consulate. Since that day, they started taking an approach with me that was like better and worse. So... You know when someone does you something good, but you know that they're doing it not out of... Pure intention. Yeah, they're doing it because for political, you know, just to save, their, save face, basically. Yeah. So from, the, from that day forward, I always had like an eye on me. They would come raid my uh, cell for fun every... See, because they were allowed to do that. So I was so they, getting... Yeah. Yeah. So they were doing everything by the books. By the books. Just by how I Everything was by the books. Yes. So if they was allowed to raid you, they would. If they was allowed to do that, they would. They would. So they tr they done it all... By the book. Yeah. I was and that doing weren't it good. By the book, but they were doing it. And their by the book is harsher than my by the yeah. book. Let's be honest. Yep. I'm in their home at the end of the day. Yep. From that day forward, I was getting all sorts of come here, come there, sit up, up, transfer me. In the middle of the night, they'll come wake me up, throw the mattress, you know, terror tactics. Uh, I remember one day, my mate, Herbod, actually, shout out Herbod. This guy was one of, one thing, all my mates, the second I went in, the line you are currently calling is engaged. So, wow. Hey, how you doing? No one wants to know me. The second I stepped foot in there, the girl I was with at the time, Two days later, she was on holiday in LA. Wow. Yeah. And I always used to think and wonder, I used to say to myself, like, the woman that I'm going to end up with, I wonder what she's doing right now while I'm sat here in this place. And funny enough, my current partner, my yeah. wife, who I'm with, you know, we laugh about it. And I'm like, where the, where the hell were you when I was there? But yeah, mates, no phone call, nothing. The only person that stuck by me is... Uh, mate wise was that guy shout out here bud london <laughs> east london boy <laughs> um used to pick up my phone calls day in day out always supported me and i'm telling you when you're in there and you've got all that on your mind a five minute phone call it's, makes yeah, of course. the difference in the world even you. if it's just to talk to the outside world and say what's going on man like mate, i used to sometimes like call family and just tell them 
what, what what's what's the, what's like, the weather like? Yeah, what's the weather like? What, the, 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 the traffic lights have they? Do you know what's the garden looking like now? Uh, JBR in Dubai have they finished the White Beach part? You, I just, you just crave anything on the outside, and it started hitting me that no one wants to know me. And I, funny enough, I call my sister, you know, and I tell her log into my Insta, have a look. Followers dropped from three thousand to. 2,500, 2,500, wow. 1,000, got to a point where I was like 400 followers. I don't care at this point, obviously. I don't, Instagram, inside, yeah. yeah, I don't care. But, but it's, it's, pretty, it's just prints with shows who's there when you really, like when, who's really by your side. Exactly. When I was splashing the cash outside. Well, your followers going up. Yeah, I was uh, taking those boys out for dinner and parties and that, everyone. You so know. how did you obviously get out then? Because at this point, nothing's changed. How Nothing's you- changed at all. Out of nowhere. See, this is where all, this is where the breaking point happened. My mum went to head of narcotics. My mother went to head of narcotics. It got so bad. Um, my father tried pulling as many strings as he could. Um, basically, in the UAE, in Dubai, in Sharjah, every Ramadan, Eid, um, any Islamic holiday, or even like New Year's, stuff like that, they do an amnesty. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're good behavior, you've done a bit of your time, they let you go. So many times, my name was put on that list. Never got out. Someone would come along with a pen and just scratch it off. Once, twice, three times. Four years in, four Ramadans, four... What's going on? Why is my name... My case partner's left three years, three and a half years ago. Why am I the only one still here? So one day my mum said, you know what, I've had enough of this. My mum and lawyer go down to the... uh, Now he's general for the... Big boss for the narcotics department. Now... You see a mother come and sit down with you, you know, asking her about your son, you know, and she's asking, look, my son was young, he'd done a mistake. What, can, what will it take? He's been four years in now. What, what's it gonna take to get out? He looks her in the eyes and says, your son is not gonna see daylight again. He's not going anywhere. He's staying here and I'm gonna make sure of it. To my mother. That must have broken your mom. Broke is an understatement. My mom, and my mom's a religious Muslim. Like, mm-hmm. I owe it, honestly, my mother was a soldier throughout those four years. That lady, she lived in Dubai, right? And I was in prison in charge. It's quite a bit of a drive. Yeah, yeah. There were two visitations a week. That lady did not miss one visitation day for four years. She was there for me twice a week, every week for four years. Every day, without fail, she picked up every single phone call of mine. My mom's a school teacher, you know, she can't be picking up phone calls. And for me, for four years, she had her phone on loud, risking her job just to pick up a phone call for me. Personally speaking, out of everything that happened to me in that situation, my idol, my, my rock for me was my mother and my father, of course, but my mother, because she, my parents had split up when I was a young age and she's a, you know, a single mom in Dubai. She she pulled strings to come and see me she she done everything she could and i would never be able to pay her back for that and one day i went for an appeal and they dropped it from death row to uh 25 to life yeah 25 to so life that was amazing that's yeah, that even though of course i understand <laughs> still 25 years but death row is a big deal but then i hadn't officially been sentenced they told me we've dropped death row you're looking at 25. And I'm going to court expecting a 25 to life sentence. Yeah. Right? Like, I'm smart. Like, you know when you're in that state where... You prepared yourself for yeah, it. Yeah, you actually go a bit loopy. Yeah. So I'm there, like, smiling, giggling. And my mates are like, are you okay? Like, I'm like, sorry, I'm going to get 25. Yeah. We get there. Blah, blah, so-and-so. Blah, blah, your charges are so-and-so. You've been sentenced to nine years in prison. I looked at him. I had the biggest smile. I was expecting 25. I looked up my mom, she sat there, bless her, she broke down crying. I was like, and I'm handcuffed. I'm like, no, it's all good, mom. Like, do you know what I mean? It's nine years. Nine years split up into two, five and four. Four for consumption, five for the possession. Yep. I get the after court, sent back to the central jail. Everyone's like, yeah, what did you get? 25? I was like, no, nah, nine. Hey, I mean, everyone's a party the, on the uh, In Dubai, is it you do full nine or you do like over here in this UK, you do half? You do half. Basically, what happened um, over there? It's not a half; it's three quarters. Okay. So technically, seven technically, years. I should have done seven and a bit. That's what I w- was mandatory, and that's what they told my mum. They said he's not going to see daylight until he does every single day. We're not letting your son out, mate. It got to a point where I said, right, this is when my faith 
in my religion became skyrocket high. I said, I said, forget the lawyers. I said, forget the strings that my parents can pull. I said, forget everything and everyone. Look, I said, it's down to me, my creator. I made decisions that brought me in here and I'm going to start making, doing actions and making decisions that will hopefully take me out of here. I started praying, reading Quran, trying to make the most out of my time in there. I started doing pottery classes, mate. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> teaching English, like, yeah. to, you know, to the blokes in there that were... And the narcotics law was established in 1992. So that the sentencing I got was a drug act, 1-8, blah, 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 yeah, you know, yeah. 1992. So the laws hadn't been changed in years and it wasn't going to be. But it was a miracle, in my opinion. One day I wake up by the grace of God. My mate, my, my bunkie, my cellmate wakes me up. He said, you're going out. Yeah. I said, what do you mean? Puts a newspaper in front of me. He says, the ruler of the country just woke up and decided to decrease all drug sentences in related to your uh, charges. Yeah. I said, no, stop talking nonsense let me sleep I've got I've, you know, I've got lunch in an hour and we got to do laundry because they yeah, do laundry on your hand in the bucket like, oh shit yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah he goes you're leaving I said what do you mean it was newspaper I read it it's yeah. like the ruler woke up one day and said we're decreasing the uh, sentences yeah and it applied to me and that means I finished my sentence I was like no nah. I was in shock for four years every day I'm waiting to I want to go out, go out, go out. And one day, suddenly they tell me you're going out. A day where you're not expecting it. A shock. Two, three days later, you know, they get my papers in order and everything. And they call my name on the microphone, bring all your stuff. You're being transported to the out jail. Out jail is where they take you to deport you back to your home country. Yeah. I got there. They keep you there for a day. Sorted my ticket out back to the UK. Put me in a van, handcuffed, passport ticket. And they gave me my phone back, which I hadn't. Like, I hadn't seen a mobile phone in four years. Yeah. I had an iPhone 4, I think, back then. Yeah. When I come out, it was that iPhone 8 or something. And I remember, like, when they gave me back my phone, bro, it took me... I didn't know how to use an iPhone anymore. Like, literally, when my sister came to meet me in the airport, <laughs> she did was you, like... Did you remember your pin? Uh, no. She was like... She had to show me. She was like, this is WhatsApp. This is, I felt like an absolute... took me, like, an hour to come to grips. And... Um, I was in shock, but the biggest shock was I thought I'll come out and life was going to be sweet. Yeah. No. You come out and a ton of bricks hits you and you're like, now what? And from there onwards, got flew back, deported back to the UAE. They take a biometric eye scan. Yeah. So basically can never enter the country again. Wow. Yeah. The second you walk into Dubai airport, camera catches your biometrics and you get That's caught. It. Yeah. You do a month and they send you back. So pointless. Um, Started, came back to the UK and obviously having, not having been in the UK for years I was like whoa everything's different coming from Dubai luxury chilling and then four years in prison and then suddenly it was a big shock and truth be told come to think of it I did my whole nine years four in yeah and I've been out now for almost four four and a half and I've only truthfully just come to terms with it all re as of recently. And at the end, there must be there must be trauma as well. There must be night like days where I don't know. Do you get scared to put a hoodie over your head sometimes? Do you get is there trauma in your life that still is is fucked for you? Because look, half them things you've said here, you've joked with me, you've laughed at it, but when you look back at it. That ain't no joke. Yeah. Like, I can't eat pot noodles. <laughs> if that's all that's been come out of it, then I see right. a pot noodle. I run because that's. A <laughs> but it's you've, that is real life trauma. That's not no joke. Yeah, I mean, I was in a, I was in a, I was in a tiny, tiny cell with 28, 27, We were twenty eight, twenty seven other guys, triple bunk beds, and I'd be waking up every other morning with Bunky on top, doing his business with his girlfriend, Partner. as they call it. So it's wake, not a joke, yeah. No, I wake up to my bunk bed. You know, <laughs> nah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'll yeah. go back to Carry, sleep. Crack on. So four years of that, it does have an effect on you. And, yeah, I'll become, and I'm not ashamed to say it. I, the first week I come out, I went into an off license. I was in Southend on Sea. Yeah. Funny enough. 
and uh, I walked into an off license to buy Red Bull. Yeah. And the panic of being around people and transact because you know for four years I'm being given my food, sleep. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had a complete panic attack and broke down, bro. Left the can, ran back home. I couldn't handle it. I couldn't leave the house for about two weeks. And a lot of people who've been in done time might relate to that when you first come out. It's and a, at you, such a young age. And at such a young There's age. There's many people who, and in obviously the circumstances it was in, in Dubai, Abroad, in Charlotte, uh, you know, and no contact with your family. Like the UK prison, like you said, is a holiday. It is. Like you're over here, you, people have got their phones, they're calling their families, they're meeting up, they're you, like... You've got the drones coming and dropping your goodies every other day. It's, <laughs> it's, it's complete different. And then living in Dubai for all the years beforehand as well, then being brought back to the UK, basically just thrown on your feet and said... Get back to shit. Yeah, it's, survive. It's not easy. And I got a question for you though. You've lived that life. Yeah, you've done it. Yeah, and it's a part of your life that you'll never forget. Absolutely not. Question here, where the obvious answer is going to be yes, but do you regret it? In the sense, as I know you're going to say, yeah, of course you do regret it. But do you regret it because of who it's turned you in today? Absolutely not. You don't regret it one bit. I was just saying it, someone. That because I was going to say, obviously, you said it helped you with your religion. It took you closer to God. Yeah. And many people I've interviewed in season two of the crime, ninety nine percent of people I've spoken to say I don't regret a thing I've done. I wish I it didn't happen, but I'd done it, and it's built me into who I am today. And I a hundred percent agree with that. And I was just saying it today. I, I would do it all over again. Genuinely. As painful as it was i'd do it all over again and i'll do it even properly do you know what's my biggest regret not doing it big enough that i didn't read enough books and play enough chess in there fair enough but look it, it's it's crazy to hear your story there's people probably always sat here there's going to be news art articles in the podcast so you would have Absolutely. seen it all it's all bbc legit. berkshire the whole lot <laughs> and it's it's a story that i don't think has ever been told. This no, is your you're first, the first person. This is your first podcast. So thank you for coming on firstly. No, thank you for having me. No, don't be silly. Honestly, you reached out to me. I'll tell you all the story who's watching this. If you're still watching it to the end, you get to let know of how Z found me. So DM me on Insta. I, I got to be honest, I opened it, read it. I was like, fuck off, man. Like, <laughs> I was like, do you know how many DMs I get a day telling me, oh, I've done it. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I looked at my mind. I was like, oh, yeah, all right, mate. Fuck off, whatever. Replied back to him. I was like, yeah, yeah, what? Told me a story. And I was like, raw. Like, shit, that's serious. So you lot have had the pleasure of hearing the story. And this is in a nutshell. Yeah. And definitely, the way I do all my podcasts, I always say to everyone, you've watched them, you know, leave comments. We will do a part two, and I will ask the questions you want me to ask him, because there's only so much I can ask him without the viewers, obviously, Absolutely. telling me what they want to hear. Absolutely. There's a part two. There's, uh, you know, there's, there's lessons there learned. There's businesses that I've followed up with. There's, there's, there's how I've transformed it. I've come a long way and definitely, definitely a part two is Look, on the horizon, this is, Mikey. This is, we, we, as much as I'd love to dive into it, we're probably filming for about an hour and a half now. We and have, we have. I want to leave this, I want people to understand your life now. We can do the afterlife after, Absolutely. that'll be in season another one, life after prison. And I'll make sure you're involved in that one. Absolutely. But genuinely, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me, Mikey. And guys, make sure you do like, comment and subscribe and make sure you follow Z on all his platforms, socials, whatever, and see him after torture pretty much because that that weren't nice not nice but if you go to dubai on holiday <laughs> send, him pic send him pictures send him pictures be careful <laughs> but genuinely thank you for coming on man thank you for having me